So I'm out here trying to get the cats acclimated. And you see this little guy. Uh, this fat fuck is like chasing him down, but also keeps laying down. And he's gonna he's gonna follow him, but then lay down again. But you could tell he's uh, not happy, even though he's clearly the antagonist. Oh, uh, you you really uh, you, you're gonna go lay down again, aren't you? Yep, because he's fucking fat. Um. But that little guy weighs eight pounds. And this chonk weighs 18 pounds. Yeah, you big. So, obviously I want to make sure that uh, he don't do something. Because he's big enough that he could wreck this little cat. Then, what do we have this time? Unlike most of the entries in these seri this series, uh, I do assume that this time around you've actually watched one of the other non-introduction videos. And that's the type system. Comparisons of the type systems. If you haven't watched that yet, uh, I would recommend that you do. I'm going to have some brief explanations of things to kind of cover it because I know not everybody is going to actually do that, even though you should. That'll at least have people knowing what the hell I'm actually talking about. So the specific thing that I want to talk about is arrays. Such a simple type. What is there to really talk about? A lot, actually. Types, certain types are so integral to the language, and how it behaves, and what can be done with it. What you have to do to get around problems with the arrays. That actually has a really big impact. Now, Many of you know that I am a performance guy, so the arrays, like they're implemented in, say, Python, are a fucking joke and I want nothing to do with them. But luckily, luckily, as far as the performance side of things go, Ada and C-Sharp both implement things well. Not a whole lot of complaint I gotta give as far as either of them go. So that's pretty awesome. Where there is stuff to point out, however. It's a minor, minor thing. But the default behavior for passing arrays around in each of these languages is different. C Sharp does them by references. Array itself is a class, so all arrays derived from it, regardless of what the element type is, is also a class. That's fine. I don't really have a problem with that. Um, certainly is convenient to be able to stack allocate those at times, but C Sharp has ways of doing that. In fact, you can define an array, but rather than the new operator, use the stack alloc operator and a pointer or span. Span is what I would recommend doing nowadays. But sometimes you'll just go with a pointer. And you get that whole behavior. It's still stack allocated. So you, I'm not going to give C Sharp too much shit over that. You essentially get both stack allocated in memory, like non-heap allocated memory, if you really need that. And within the constraints where that type of situation is appropriate, or heap allocated, 
by default. Getting the higher usability that you get out of that, a lot of the conveniences that people don't realize until they have to work without it, it's really handy. So, simply put, arrays in C-sharp, typically speaking, heap allocated. They might not be. But overwhelmingly, we're going to be talking about this in myths that are heap allocated. Okay. Ada does something very similar to Rust. The arrays are not heap allocated. That being said, they don't do what C does. An array in C doesn't have a defined length. You hopefully have set aside enough memory to fit what you intend, but you can always go beyond that because what it really looks for for its end is a null terminator. It becomes a little interesting when you actually have to represent an octet zero zero, but or I guess just zero octet zero. But still, you um, it's null terminator. I and Rust and C sharp. But they all have an actual value that is set aside to indicate the length of the array. Now it's allocated if necessary with that specific size, otherwise it just puts it in there. But uh, that's convenient. Null termination, horrible idea but one we have to live with, at least sometimes. So, in both Ada and Rust's case, it's not a reference. You get the array. Now, for optimization's sake, you probably want to pass that around by reference still, and I had a typically will. I'm not sure what Rust's behavior, but I'm assuming they typically pass that around by reference as well. But I'm not super familiar with how Rust does things. Um, Ada semantics allow a parameter to be passed by value or by reference in many situations, depending on exactly what... Uh, the rules for it are incredibly complicated. It's nowhere near as straightforward in other languages, but they are, I think, a justifiable complexity. But that's not something I want to get into in this video. But it could be passed around by either, depending on things like the size of the array and other factors. The problem you run into with both at unrust is that when you assign a variable that of the type an array and whatever the stuff is people coming from other languages especially languages like c sharp where the array is a reference type expect to be able to assign a new array of a different length to that variable and you can't. The variable that you have is not a reference. It is the specific array. So if you've said that's an array of 10 elements, then it's an array of 10 elements. Exactly. If you do that in C sharp, Java, hell, Python, any, anything where it's passed around by reference instead. If you say you have an array 
integer that's 10 elements wide, then you can fit 10 elements in that and not have to reuse the reference. If the language does semi-reasonable things, then it's probably going to be an immutable array, but that's not always the case, and sometimes, depending on how the language standard library is set up, it may be justified. In C-sharp, I feel like it is. But you can also set it a new array of a different size. The reason that works is because the variable is a reference. It was referencing a location in memory where an integer array of 10 items long lived. But it can now point to a new integer array of 14 items long, or 4 items long, or null. This is convenient, actually. But here's an actually an amusing situation where I get to point out something that Ida does that Rust doesn't. Ida actually gets this right. Which is surprising because Rust has years of Ida's experience to build on. Years of taking a look at what Ida does and what it did it do right and copy that and what did it do wrong and not repeat those mistakes. Rust actually makes this mistake. This is where the by value part about Ida and Rust's arrays becomes very important. Passing an object by value means that you are passing the entire thing as its data structure is. So this means passing the entire array. Again, there are tricks for getting around this. You can leave it at the same location in memory to simply create a reference to that, but you still need information about that reference. It needs to be a so-called fat pointer which Ida access types are. But you don't want to use pointers, ideally. So, it's understandable. You can return an array created within a function in Ida. A lot of situations where you would want to do that. That's hugely useful. You can't do that in Rust. It's not considered a safe operation. Okay, but is it a dangerous operation in Eta? And how does it accomplish this? Is it simply that it's just too complicated to make it safe? Or, like, what, what's the deal here? Well, it's not considered a safe operation in Rust because you wouldn't know the bounds of the array. And if you're just pointing to where the array begins, that's definitely true. But there are schemes for getting around this. Numerous different schemes, each with different trade-offs. But what Ida does is there's a second stack that exists within the runtime. This is optional. If it doesn't exist, you get Rust-like behavior where you can't return an array. But if it does exist, you can return an array of an unconstrained size from a function. When that function returns, the secondary stack will hold information about how long that array is and any additional information that the secondary stack needs to hold. And things work as expected. So is it dangerous? Not that I've found at all. Not that any experienced at a programmer I know has found. Maybe there is something I'm not aware of, but I find it much more likely that the Rust developers just haven't thought of that solution. Now, there are other options, of course. The fly can fuck right off. Get 
Okay, there are other options, of course. In fact, in the C++ world, we can see dozens of these options. Or maybe just a dozen, but still, that's a lot of different implementations for arrays. Most of them have to do with strings specifically, but uh, regardless, they do apply to any array. One such immediately obvious option would be to store the length at the position just before where the array actually begins. So the pointer would be to the very beginning of the array, and the pointer address minus one would get you the length of the array. This works. It's reasonably robust, and it's very hackable. All you need to do is cast something to a void pointer, and then cast it to an array pointer, and you can now access the element just before the element that you were intending to address. Because there are functions that'll get you the length of an array by looking at that. Which means you have a way to get the integer representation of whatever the data was just before the address that you're supposed to have. So that's, that's problematic. That allows you to, in a very minimal way, escape the bounds of where you're actually supposed to be looking into. It's problematic. Another option that's actually quite brilliant, and that I think should be the default way these are implemented for any language at all, especially for strings. This is, as far as the array the implementations goes really more of a string specific thing, but it, it, it applies to arrays in general. Some of y'all ain't gonna like this, but it's null terminated. Just with some additional things to consider. This actually has the very nice implementation detail of it, or not implication, rather, of it being a bounded string by default. What I mean by this, for the people who are unfamiliar with this part of Ada, or unfamiliar with Ada in general, is a bounded string is kind of like a string you see in a database, where it has a maximum size, but it can easily contain strings that are smaller than it. You'll have to get the length of the actual string out of it, but It'll store anything smaller than it, reasonably easily. This is how the FB string works. Now, if you haven't, if you're unfamiliar with this, Facebook developed it, hence FB string. It's open source. Check it out. It's fucking awesome. It is one of the most clever designs I have ever seen for anything in my life. It is absolutely brilliant. I love, love the design and what it, it uh, results in. When you allocate an FB string, it sets aside a chunk of memory. The amount of memory stored is put at the very, very last address. Oh, in typical C slash C++ style allocation for these, it allocates one more than what you actually asked for. So if you ask for 32 addresses, it allocates 33, puts the you know, uses the 33rd one as it tended for the null terminator, that kind of thing. Or I think, maybe I'm getting that backwards. Maybe it really gives you 32, but you're only able to use 31. I forget how that works, to be perfectly honest. I haven't programmed in C in a very long time. Either way, the last bit, byte, last byte, is reserved and stores the amount of addresses that you can use up. Okay. The amount of slots in the array. Okay. So why is that special? Why would you put it at the very end? Isn't that a weird spot? What, couldn't you override it? 
it's the amount of slots you have left to use up. This means that when you got the array originally, it's a bunch of zeros. Null terminators. And you add elements to that that counter decrements. Eventually you fill the thing and it decrements to zero. The null terminator. You see how that works now. I'm gonna go break up a fight between two of the cats. I'm sure you can guess which ones. But, uh, so I'd left off about the um, the FB string. It's remaining count happens to count down to what is exactly the null terminator anyways. Which is a very, very clever design. Um, that, I think, is the ideal implementation for how arrays should exist. There isn't really much that does that. Uh, no standard C++ uh, library does that, although I'm not sure if they could. I'm not sure about the C++ standard rules. An ADA runtime could do that. Is it very useful? Actually, yeah. When it comes to marshalling between C libraries and as much shit as ADA gives uh, C, ADA is supposed to default to the normal operating system behavior, often C libraries, in a huge amount of instances. So if your marshalling code doesn't actually need to change the string at all, that's fantastic. Would Ada be able to do that? Nah. Not in practice. Technically speaking, yes, there's nothing in the ARM that is stopping that from happening, and I think it should, but I can't see any of the Ada compiler vendors actually doing that. Now, does C Sharp or .NET in general do that? No. To be perfectly honest with you, I'm not sure exactly where the array length is stored as far as .NET goes. I figure they've probably been smart enough to learn that the um, storing it just before the actual array exists probably isn't the best option, but I'm not sure. I haven't looked into the implementation details, and who knows, maybe parts of the way that the .NET language works prevents you from being able to abuse that through um, actually it does. So they probably do the simpler thing and put it just before because that act, yeah. You can only create pointers to very specific types if, in .NET languages. There are incredibly specific rules about what you can create a pointer to. Not a reference. Tons of things can exist as reference type, and you can even create references to structs now. Then you've got the ref struct, which is always passed around by reference, but that's its own thing. But you can, you can create references to value types. I'm talking pointers. Dumb, simple pointers. It's got very strict rules on what you could do with them. And while you could cast it to a void pointer, you could not then cast it to a integer array or any other type of array and get the index minus one to escape it. Even if you were to try, you're going to get an exception because it's still managed pointers. There's still tons of checking to make sure stuff's done safely, reasonably safely. It's still unsafe code, but it's you know, reasonably safely. But you wouldn't even be able to cast it to the array type in the first place because that's not an allowable type as a pointer. You can use pointers like arrays, 
in an unsafe context when you have a pointer type. The array indexer is actually a pointer offset. But again, there is enough checking, even though it's unsafe code, to make sure that you don't index outside of where you reasonably should. So no special pointer trickery. So yeah, they probably do just store it right before the array itself. Not a bad idea. You know you have that checking. You know how you have that safety. That's probably what they do. But this isn't only about how arrays are implemented. There's another factor that I think is something that Ida does horribly, horribly wrong. The whole reason why you should have watched the previous video on the type systems in general is that Ida does nominative typing, whereas .NET doesn't. .NET is much more of a structural, class-wide kind of thing going on. You can kind of view it as, in .NET, the arrays are anonymous. And if Ida had a syntax for an anonymous array, much like they do have for anonymous access types, you'd be able to get around this. Will they add such a thing? I doubt it. I strongly think they should. Um, especially considering Ida has the potential to be a major player as far as numerical computing languages goes. Has the potential to take over Fortran, but will they make the right decisions to accomplish that? No, I don't think so. Anonymous arrays would be one of the required things as far as that goes. The reason for it? Well, when you define new functions, they have to take a type. You can't do an anonymous array type. So what you have to do is define a new array of the numeric elements that is unbounded. Unconstrained, rather. Not unbounded. Unconstrained. It'll have its bounds at the creation site, but those bounds can vary. So that's unconstrained. So, it's fine and dandy and all, but it does mean you now have to write those functions to those specific names. Somebody else comes along, writes another complementary mathematics package. That you don't implement each other's stuff. It has its own name for an integer array. Still of the same exact element, still unconstrained, but has a different name. Even if the immediate name is the same, the fully qualified names are different, and that means they are still incompatible in a nominative system. Functions written for one of these names are incompatible with functions written for the other name. You have to cast the arrays between the two names. Seriously. No actual conversion happens. There's no performance overhead for this. Assuming the compiler's smart enough to realize that they are structurally identical. If the compiler's not smart enough for that, well, you're going to have checks that literally don't need to be done. So that's fun. But even, even if it's smart enough to recognize that those checks don't need to be there and can be completely removed. That still litters your code. You've got ton conversions all over the place that do not need to be there. Because they are the same. Now, if you had an anonymous type, it could work for any array of integer, any array of float, any array of uh, decimal. Sure can do that in .NET. Sure can do that in, well, the majority of languages. Nominative has its uses. Nominative typing has its uses. I mentioned that 
in uh, the, the type systems video. There are situations where you want very particular semantics, and having a name behind it to enforce that is useful. But that should be in addition to the language at a later point. Anonymous arrays should be there from the very beginning, with named arrays being added in later. Not the other way around. This makes it very, very difficult to develop. Very tedious, rather. It's not difficult. It's not like it's hard to do this. But it's incredibly tedious to do this in Ida. To have to create a type and use that type name throughout everything. And even if you're the consumer of it, to, to regularly cast between two different things because the library, one of the libraries that you're doing doesn't have stuff that the other one does and you need stuff from both of them. It's just a pain in the ass. Whereas in the .NET world, each of them can just write their functions for arrays of the different numeric types. That's ridiculous. Arrays in many languages could use a lot, a bit of work, but they could use a lot of work in Ada. Ada loses big time on this one. This isn't even a situation where I can argue that it is justifiable in a specific niche, and that that niche happens to fit exactly what the language niche is anyways. This is literally just... I'd have fucked up. Until the next video, have a good one, guys.